So it's great to be with you all today, both in the sanctuary and on Zoom. I look forward to see, hope, hope to see some of you at the Newcomer Circle, which will be in Summit House at 1215. And I hope you will stay for all the wonderful arts and crafts vendors and pitch in with the uh, tree decorating here in the sanctuary. So there's always much going on at the U Congregation of Charlottesville. And let me just say that it is such a joy and a privilege and something that fills me with radical amazement when I stand in this pulpit on Sunday mornings. I know that some of you are undoubtedly filled with joy and hope, while others may be coming with hearts that are heavy or perhaps even broken. I also know that many who journey into Unitarian Universalism do so after years of spiritual searching and perhaps even struggling. And I know that all of you lead very busy lives and that finding time to be part of Sunday morning, of Sunday morning service can be challenging. So I just want to begin this morning by saying thank you for being here and for inviting the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Charlottesville into your lives. We are so blessed to share this journey with all of you. Now, I first encountered this term radical amazement when I read some of Rabbi Heschel's writings, and you heard a brief excerpt from some of those writings from Mary Beth. Heschel was a rabbi and a theologian, and his ideas remain important and influential, even though he died now about 40 years ago. He wrote timeless works about the prophets of the Hebrew Bible, the importance of Sabbath and rest, and about the nature of God and spiritual life. And he also counted among his many friends, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And Rabbi Heschel, there's a famous picture of him walking with Dr. King arm in arm across the Edmund Pettus Bridge in Selma, Alabama. But if I had to choose one idea, one concept from Heschel's vast and extraordinary body of work that speaks to my own spiritual life and journey, it would have to be radical amazement. For one thing, I just love that term. I mean, it somehow captures the essence and the feel of those rare but extraordinary spiritual moments I think that we all experience. Moments I know in which I have found myself deeply aware and deeply connected to the mystery and the majesty of life itself. Some of those moments occurred in places of awe-inspiring beauty, while others take place, as Heschel says, in the common and small things that reveal what he calls the infinite significance of existence. And I must say that Heschel's definition of what it means to be spiritual is my absolute favorite. To be spiritual is to be amazed. Now I'll have more to say about spirituality in a few minutes, but let me simply echo Heschel's view that being spiritual enables one to see that everything is indeed phenomenal. Everything is incredible. And everything does indeed offer us intimations of the divine. Now, I know it's always risky to make assumptions, especially about Unitarian Universalists, but I'm guessing that everyone in this sanctuary and everyone joining us on Zoom has experienced the kind of moments Heschel is describing. Even if you consider yourself to be an atheist, an agnostic, a humanist, or just a good old-fashioned skeptic, the experience of awe and wonder, I think that experience is universal and part of what it means to be human. Now, Heschel was a theist. He had a very strong belief in God, and he uses the language of God and divinity to describe radical amazement. But I think even Heschel would agree that ultimately, radical amazement is an experience. 
an experience of awe and wonder, of infinite significance, not a creed or a theology. Belief or theology may follow those experiences and could provide us with, as we try to make meaning of them, but in many ways, I think radical amazement comes first, theology and belief come after. Now, one of the great privileges of being a minister is having the opportunity to listen to many of your spiritual stories, and I look forward to hearing many, many more in the future. And almost all of those stories include experiences of awe and wonder. That's what I've observed from so many of the Unitarian Universalists that I've had a chance to talk with about their journeys, how they, where they are on their journeys, what, what's their background, how did they get to where they are today. Those powerful experiences are so often part of those stories. And my own spiritual journey is no exception, and I've certainly been blessed with experiences in many, many beautiful places. But today, you know I like to tell stories. I'm gonna tell you a story about one of those places, one of those experiences. I was, it happened many years ago, many years ago, I don't even wanna tell you how many, when I was a college student spending a semester in England. I lived, I had a, lived in an apartment with a couple of roommates in London, I guess I should say a flat, sorry. And one weekend, my flat, one of my flatmates and I decided to leave the big city, catch a train to a part of England called Cornwall. Any of you ever been there before? A few of you? Yeah, it's a beautiful, beautiful area. It's located in the very southwestern sort of edge tip of the country. It's known, it's an area rich in history, culture, and a lot of beauty. Now, on our first full day, we took a bus out to the southernmost tip of Cornwall to a place very aptly known as Land's End. Land's End is located at what I think is supposed to be the most westerly point in the country of England, and is perhaps best known for steep, rocky cliffs that overlook kind of the place where the ocean and the English Channel kind of meet. After the bus dropped us off, we climbed one of those cliffs and soon found ourselves enjoying one of the most spectacular views I have ever seen. That's what it looked like. The water was deep blue, the air smelled crisp and clear, the sun was bright, and although it was early March, the temperature was surprisingly warm. So warm, in fact, that my buddy and I took our jackets off. We were there in our shirt sleeves. And as I stood there, I remember looking out over that water and feeling as if I could see forever. And as we stood atop that cliff, marveling at that beauty all around us, we noticed as we looked out over the water, out in the distance, there was what looked like a, a storm cloud heading in our direction. It was kind of small. It wasn't like the whole sky turned stormy. It was just this one little cloud. Um, and it was surrounded by blue skies and white puffy clouds. Now, having grown up in central Florida, which is known for having loud thunderstorms and vivid lightning, I've always been kind of cautious about approaching storms. But there was something different about this moment and this storm, something that led me not to seek shelter, but to stay on the cliff and welcome the approaching storm. And I am so glad I stayed because in a matter of a few minutes, I was completely, my friend and I were completely engulfed in the most amazingly beautiful snow squall that I have ever experienced. The sky darkened, the temperature dropped considerably, and snow swirled all around us. Soon it covered the ground and landscape, and the landscape went from spring to winter. It wasn't maybe not quite that much snow, but it was covered. <laughs> and then 
As suddenly as the squall appeared, it was gone. The sun returned, the temperature rose, and I once again found myself in the middle of a warm, sunny day, and pretty soon that snow cover was gone. And as I stood atop that cliff with the snow swirling in one moment and then the warm sun and blue skies returning the next, all I can say is that for that brief moment, I was truly standing on sacred ground and experiencing radical amazement. In that moment, in that place, I felt so small as I was being engulfed by that snow squall and then bathed in the sunshine and blue sky. I was part of something greater, part of a universe of incomparable beauty, immense power, and great, great mystery. For the briefest time, I experienced my life not as a kind of linear, straight line that is sort of follows the contours of my life and journey, but rather as just an infinite and awe-inspiring circle, um, I, don't, I don't even have the right words, in which I am unique but interrelated, free and yet deeply connected to all that surrounds me. On that beautiful coastline in the midst of that incredible snow squall, I was indeed overwhelmed by radical amazement and experienced a truth and a reality so beautiful, so powerful, and so mysterious that I've come to call it God, the divine. Now, I don't want to give you the impression that my use of God language to describe what happened to me on that cliff implies that I fully understand my experience, that I figured out the meaning of existence. Looking back on that moment and others that I've had since then, the phrase that best describes where I am today around ultimate questions is awe-inspiring mystery. But there is one thing I can say for certain about all my experiences of that awe-inspiring mystery. From the moment I was enveloped in that snow squall right up to the present, those moments of awe, beauty, and mystery have most certainly been deeply, deeply spiritual. Now, as I said before, terms like spiritual and spirituality can be very confusing, and they can be rather misunderstood. They are used in so many different contexts and so many different ways. Think for a moment about the very common use of the word spiritual by those who don't really like organized religion, as in I'm spiritual but not religious. Then there are some who reject any use of the word spiritual or spirituality because they equate them with belief, suggesting that being spiritual means I have a creed, I believe in, I have a firm belief in God, I've got it all figured out. Well, I don't I have a very different understanding of what it means to be spiritual. You see, when I reflect back on those moments of deep connection in my own life, it is clear to me that what mattered most was not what I believed in that moment, but what I was experiencing. When I stood in that cliff in that snow squall, I didn't have the first clue what I believed about God, and at that time in my journey, or religion, or much of anything else for that matter. I was a college kid, and that was okay, although I know a lot of college kids that are way more got it together than I had it back together then, that's for sure. But you know what? That was okay because that moment was about experience and connection, not doctrine or dogma. For me, spirituality is all about experiencing deep connection to something, to mystery. Maybe it's God. Maybe it's the yearnings of the human heart. Maybe it's the mystery and majesty of life but something that leads us to a place of peace, awe, and, an, and for me, an overwhelming sense of oneness and unity with existence. Now, I think in, in trying to understand what it means to be spiritual, I always like to remind us about the origins of the word spirit. It's derived from an ancient Hebrew word, 
ruah, which literally means breath or wind. In the Hebrew Bible, ruah or spirit is the breath or essence of life. It is the life force, the energy, the rhythm, the pulse of creation. Ruah is the wind or the breeze from God in the book of Genesis at the very beginning that stirs the primordial waters on creation morning. And it is that same wind, that same breath that fills our lives and caresses our cheeks in those moments of awe and wonder. So, looking at the etymology of the word, to be spiritual is to breathe in, to be one with that essence. It is to slow down, to be present, and to inhale the breath of life. In fact, the original meaning of the word inspiration is to breathe in the essence or spirit of life. And if being spiritual is about experience before belief, spirituality is everything that enables one to experience radical amazement, to be inspired and to breathe in that essence. Being spiritual, I think, first and foremost is about being open, being curious, being open to those moments of deep connection, and even cultivating them. I must say that when someone, and I've had a few people do this in my time as a UU minister, tells me that, well, they don't do, they're not spiritual, they don't do that whole spirituality thing, because they're an atheist, they're a skeptic. I think being an atheist and a skeptic are great, but I don't understand, I have to say, I don't understand what they have to do with spirituality. Because spirituality is about experience, it's about that deep connection. It's not about what conclusions you draw from that deep connection, or if you draw any conclusions at all. And at the same time, spiritual growth doesn't have anything to do with moving toward a particular belief or doctrine. It can, but rather to me, as I said before, it's about cultivating that greater openness to and deeper awareness of the beauty, blessings, and mysteries of life. And let me just finish up with a word about the relationship between spirituality and that other thing, religion. Think for a moment about the way religion is typically understood. Religion, right, equals faith, belief, belief in creeds and doctrines and the literal truth of sacred texts. But I think when one goes a little deeper, it turns out that while religion can be understood in this way, it doesn't have to be. Now take for example, and I'm, I like looking up the origins of words, take for example the origin, the root of the word religion. It's a Latin word, religare, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, which means to bind, connect, or join. Religare has the same root word that the root ligament does, right? Ligaments tie or connect bones together. So, such, so much like a ligament binds bones together, religion is something that binds or connects human beings. Now, that something could be a belief or a doctrine about God or the supernatural, but I think as we Unitarian Universalists have discovered, religion doesn't have to be rooted in a single belief or one conception of ultimate reality. Human beings can be connected to many different things in many different ways. We can be connected by ethical values and principles, love, freedom, justice, and compassion, while also being open to diverse understandings of the mystery and meaning of existence. And it is this understanding of religion that is at the heart of Unitarian Universalism and that I can tell you has enriched and transformed my spiritual life. I have come to see that far from simply being about having faith or believing in a particular creed, religion can be about making a shared journey rooted in unconditional love and the search for truth and meaning. Religion can be as much if not more about asking questions and exploring the mysteries of life as it is about having all the answers. And religion can be about listening and learning and being open to the truth and wisdom found not just on a cliff engulfed in a snow squall overlooking the English Channel, but in the stories and experiences of everyone, of each and every one of you. 
Friends, how you choose to experience deep connection and to cultivate radical amazement is ultimately up to you. Unitarian Universalism doesn't insist that you follow one method or one practice or any method or any practice at all. But we do seek and we do hope that you will choose to live your life with intention, with purpose, and with openness to the beauty, the mystery, and the possibilities of life. For if we are open to those moments of deep connection, the breath of life will be like a gentle breeze, bringing us peace, hope, and love. Blessed be, thank you so very much for listening, and amen.